Hello here at Willie Cottage. Bear with me if I end up in a coffee fit. I've not been well at all this week. I'm still not 100% now. Um, so today, um, I thought we would do something a little bit different because I'm trying to avoid fluff because it's just aggravating my cough. So I thought what we'd do is um, look up this information that these you can't get from Sarah Howard anymore. I don't know if you can read that. It says, wear your weaving. And it's making a mock-up for your hand-woven garment. And it's by Sarah Howard. She doesn't sell these anymore. Um, and not for resale. And this one is cutting without fear. Now, I'm sure I have got a weaving book downstairs. It was um, partnership written by Jenny Howard and somebody else. I, can't, I think at this moment in time, can't come to mind. Um, I can't think who it was. I'm sure I've got a book downstairs and it's all, it's one of the books I mentioned in my res, review, one of my book reviews um, a few months back. And it was the one where the colour inspirations, I think it was that one. And they mentioned about cutting fabrics and making clothes out of that in the back of that book, if I remember rightly. It was one of those ones anyway. So I thought, I'll go through these little pamphlets that Sarah sent out to me when I first started this project of doing this with you guys. Oh, excuse me. And my pattern for my coat, which I have. I've got a few sewing projects that, that I want to do over the next few months. Um, so I have got waiting to come sometime in the next few days. Hopefully it'll arrive this Friday. It's supposed to arrive this week, but I clothes. A clothes dummy mannequin for doing clothes for myself. I've been wanting one for ages, but it's a belated birthday present, so I managed to get one for a decent price. Um, so I'll open these up and get them out. So I thought, well, what we'll do is talk about what next stage is, because some of you might already be further on than I am. Um, I'm nearly, I would say I'm about three quarters of the way through um, weaving up my cloth downstairs. Oh, do you know, I've got sweaty eyelids. Uh, weaving up my cloth downstairs. I'm probably about three quarters of the way through, so I'm not quite there, but I'm nearly there. And I know there's a couple of you that will be at that stage now. We'll have your fabric already done and put to one side for your own projects that you want to do. So I thought I'd go through these little pamphlets that I've got. Um, give me a poke. Um, either through my Iona, please stop it. Um, either through my Facebook Messenger or you can tag me on WhatsApp as well. I'm on WhatsApp on my business profile um, or on Instagram in private messages. And I will um, take a couple of screen photos of these for you. Um, if you've got a batty club, just let me know and I will see if I can come up with even just quickly photocopying these pages for you. I mean, to be honest, Sarah did pass me them on and... They're not for resale, so I can't sell them or anything else. Hiya, Bridie. How are you doing, sweetie? Excuse me. If I have to hide for a second to have a coffee fit, bear with me. I've had issues with um, open reaches working on a box up the top of the street, and I had to go run out and tell them to get me bloody well reconnected. Um, yeah, it knocked me off. So I was just talking about these pamphlets that I got from Sarah Howard. The, this one, if you can't see, it says where you're, um, where you're weaving, making a mock-up for your hand-woven garment and cutting without fear pamphlet. Now, Sarah doesn't do these anymore. Um, in the garden, garden Dutch spotted. I've got a Dutch spotted down there that I really need to get sorted out. I got it from the Orkney Shepherdess last summer and I still haven't sorted it. Um, I need to get that done. We've not had, we've had no more than a day's worth of sunny weather every week. For the last couple of weeks yeah they look interesting they are quite interesting i've literally just took them out of the envelopes they're not for resale she doesn't print them anymore um but so i can't sell them she doesn't do them for sale anymore she just knew that i was doing this um this video select of the weave along with one of my with one of the patterns i got from her so i'm quite happy to do a couple of screenshots or just quickly photograph off some of the uh, these two that I've got and I can throw them in with your batty clubs let me know or I can screenshot them just DM them to you and then you can save them to your phone which might actually be easy up oh, just as quick to do that so um, <coughs> oh dear <coughs> so 
where you're weaving, making a mock-up of your garment. So, Blatant Birthday Present, Phil's ordered me from Amazon a um, adjustable clothes dummy because I want to, me and Phil still haven't got married yet and I want to make my own dress for it. For, well, when he finally gets us booked in somewhere, I know. Um, so, I've been wanting a clothes, like uh, an adjustable mannequin for ages to make my own stuff with. And I've ordered some calico as well, so I can at least I can do the things properly for doing the mock-up while I'm still finishing off the last quarter or so. Yeah, it's about a quarter I've got left of my, my yardage meterage on my weaving to do. So I thought, well, we'll get to this stage now where a lot of you have got your weaving put to side. I'm sure Anne, Anne F um, Fen Weaver's got her fabric already weave, woven up and done. She wants to make a waistcoat with hers. So at least this way. I can talk to it, get about that stage now, get it out of the way, and then I'll do the mock-up. Hopefully, my mannequin comes. It's supposed to be at the end of this week, but if it takes the next week till it comes, and then that's just the way it is. I'll just have to wait for it to turn up. But anyway, get on with And I can't touch any fluff, because the minute I start touching any fluff, it just triggers off my cough, and it's just ridiculous. So, where you weaving, mock-up for your garment hand-woven. So she goes on to say, how to use this booklet to ensure a good fit and test the suitability of your hand-woven fabric for a particular garment, I suggest making a mock-up, sometimes called muslin, toil or a pretest. First, from an inexpensive piece of purchased fabric or a similar thickness and drape. By doing this first, you'll know that your hand weaving won't be wasted and you'll find some, you'll have something that fits you and love to wear. And this may seem like a bit of wasted time when you want to get on with the real thing, but it can save a lot of hard work and alterations later on. Um, she makes a, make, a mock up and wear it all day to see how comfortable it is and how it fits before she makes any adjustments. So like clothes. I can buy size 12 clothes at a one shop, but then it seems on the, on the shirt will sit too low on my arm, but it'll fit me perfectly around the chest. And it's been able to do those sort of adjustments to bring up the arms and sit them up on the tops of your shoulders where they sort of should be on this end. Or sometimes you've got um, too much slack in the back, but there's something not going on quite round here. And you might find the same with a woven project. So it's just been able to understand what alterations you need to do. I mean, you could, there's nothing to say that you couldn't use an old bed sheet or something like that, or an old pair of curtains, because that's got a, wo a woven drape to it. It's an old pair of curtains that you can use, that you can cut up and, and create something out of the pattern that you want to use before you touch your own woven project. Especially if you use expensive fibres in it. Um, although loom shaped garments are easy to construct, they have little shaping and can be unflattering. So I prefer to design to make sewing patterns that have some basic shaping, perhaps it's a neckline or a shoulder or an armhole. Get weaving patterns of specifically designed for narrow hand woven fabrics. Uh, pieces of all similar width and making maximum use of the slivage ends to make little wastage. So she goes on to make you mock up for when you get started. Obviously your sewing pattern, a non-stretchy firm fabric, calico or cotton is good, plain colour or striped. A sharp dressmaker's scissors with blades at least 20 centimetres towards hide your sewing scissors so nobody touches them for paper or cutting plastic. Household scissors to cut your paper pattern, small scissors for cutting your threads. Stitch ripper to unpick the unwanted stitches. Good quality dressmaker's pins, assortment of hand and machine needles. A tape measure with marked on both sides. A ruler. Why do you need a ruler and scissors and a tape measure? Tailor's chalk iron and an ironing board a sewing machine kept clean and good running condition and basic toolkit <coughs> a variety of colored threads suitable for the sewing machine a box to keep your sewing tools safe a notebook pens and pencils and a friend to help you with fitting would be great a dress form is an excellent help and one that can easily be adjusted to your size i have seen in some charity shops the um they have um, the mannequins, you know, the half bodies are literally just that size down to like the hips. You know, the torso ones and all that's inside them is polystyrene foam and they've been wrapped around in a black fabric or something like that or a velvet. Iona, move. I've ended up with all the animals in the room. Ninja, get out, mate. He's not allowed in here. Um, 
and you can some charity shops sell them if you say to them like is there any chance i could buy that off you and it's a donation you can get for about 10 15 quid if you just ask them and that might be something that's handy to use plenty of cake in copious amounts of tea oh god no cake makes me choke the bits will stick in the back of me phlegmy throat there's just no point phil's making me a cup of tea now a nice fruit tea and i need to take my tablets um so she says go on about um taking your measurements so before you even start cutting anything take your measurements so you want your full shoulder measurements you want your bust measurements your waist and your hips depending on what it is that you're making so i'm making a coat so i need to know the exact dimensions i need for my, my shoulders with a little bit of give because i don't like things that are tight and it, you know it's like when i'm still at that age where i still have that time of the month so i feel bloated and don't want restrictions and movements i want things to sit on me comfortable so just get a friend to help you take measurements you may not need all of them but it's useful to have them for future planning and record them on a chart working centimeters or inches whichever you're familiar with dress in a leotard i don't even own a swimming costume oh dear or underwear and stand barefoot tie a piece of ribbon around your natural waistline to help with measuring wrap the tape so that it's snug but not tight when you take your measurements once you have your full set of measurements you can compare them to the standard on the back of the pattern envelope that you'll be between sort of sizes so with that yeah get a piece of ribbon or something like or a piece of wool but the hundred percent wool, the stuff that doesn't stretch and then use that just to lightly go around now I was always told when you measured your, your your breasts, I was it just above here that you measure and under here you measure. And then that's supposed to give you your sort of your, your bust size. I can't remember. Anyway, so they're saying that she says on here, recorded down for, in, think, uh, for measurements for your bust, an average medium. So we'll go for medium measurements because the majority of us aren't very small. I'm a I vary on a 10 to 12 going into a 14 depends on where I am buying my clothes um, so my average bust for my size will be a 34 to 36 inch which I am I'm usually 34 but I've got up to 36 because I'm middle-aged and getting old so that's the size I need for that my waist size it says 26 to 28 I'm not. I'm veering on the large on that one for definite. Around right about a 30, 32 is where my waist is sort of going to a point. I'm not even. I'm not even got a shape anymore. I look like a milk bottle. Um, and then yeah, and the bus size on a third on a 16 to 18, which is a, a UK large, is roughly 30 to 40 inches on the on the chest. So I'm presuming most of us are all doing sort of jackets or waistcoats, that sort of thing. I don't think anyone's mentioned making any skirts or shorts or any um, shorts versions or the dungarees or trousers or anything. But if that's the case, you want to measure your hips. You want to do your waist. I own a dog look. So, oh, I'll just move you around. So, stock order. So... You want to do around your waist for your trousers and you want this is your hips literally right so there's my non-existent waist i do still have a bit of a waist and then i've got my flubbery bits and then you really want to be measuring this bit so where your little pocket stud is that's roughly the height of where your hips is i mean i know you've got this bulbous bit but this is the bit that you want so you've got your waist here and then you've got your hand and it should roughly be a thumb to second finger hand span on everybody the, i mean we've all got these weird matrix proportions that there is certain it's like your forearm to your your hand is supposed to be the same length as your knee down to your ankle so it's it's nature's way of letting us know what's right and what's wrong so pinch your put your thumb in the side of your waist roughly and it should be just above your your jeans and then pinch down to your second finger and that will roughly give you where the beginnings of your hips start sort of the ball crux of that area and that is the bit those are the two bits that you want to measure up with okay oh as for your bust have i got a tape measure here do you know what i don't have a tape measure and i did have a tape measure up here the other day i have my little sheet one and i don't know where he's disappeared to but your, your bust i mean 
I think when it comes, if you just want the basics of measuring your bust, let me see, let me see, what have I got, what have I got, what have I got? Uh, never got anything around when you want it, so I've got this cone of, of wool, it'll do, if I can put the flaming end of it, and I'll take my cardigan off, because it's a bit too baggy, and I've got a vest top underneath here, but I might as well just do it like this, so literally just pull it around, put it so it's just sitting round about where your bra strap is and then for anyone that's never done this before and then just literally pinch it i mean i could get my hand in there but i think that's literally on the cusp of my boobs and that would be the measurement that i would go for from there to there and then i would get a tape measure i mean what you could technically do is just snap that that put a piece of paper like a sticky paper around it and then just write in, right, this is my boob measurement and the centimetres that that full length is. And then you can just wrap it on your hand. It's labelled. And then put it in your little sewing kit bag. And then do the exact same thing for your waist. So I'll do my waist. Wrap it all the way around. Don't need to do it tight. I just want to get a realistic measurement because you've got to take into account that your tummy swells when you're feeling a bit bloated. So that will now be the length of my waist. So I'll just snap that. Do the exact same thing. Bit of tape, piece of paper. Write down the measurements and what it's for. So that'll be my waist and say it's 34 centimeters. Wrap that up. that to one side and then I've got that for record. And then do the same again on my hips. So I'll just gather a bit more because I am 47. And again, there's my hips here. And to make sure I've got the end right, I don't want to do it too, too tightly because that's just the measurement I've got. And then again, piece of paper, write it down, get your sellotape, stick it to your sellotape, wrap it around your piece of thread and then just bundle it up and that's you've got your measurement for that to one side. And then I think the hardest thing for me would be measuring my shoulders. So if you're on your own and you don't have anybody, the only way I can think of doing it is if you did that, literally. So straighten yourself up, try and not curve your shoulders, pinch them back as far as you can. And then I've literally got that to that. And I can feel that it's just on the other side of both my shoulder joints. If I was, to, I mean, I have issues trying to get there. So yeah, even if I was to do it from behind, it gets caught on my collar. I can't quite get there, but yeah, it is sitting. Because I think when you get to a certain age, you forget to stand up straight. So your shoulders do start to curve in a little bit. But if I stretch my shoulders out and bust out a little bit, I can, that's definitely going to give me the measurement that I need for my shoulders. And I have issues trying to get this arm to go up any higher than that anyway. So once again, there's my shoulder measurement as far as I'm concerned. If you needed a double length like for a wrap around, then just double the length of what that is. So that's at least shoulder to shoulder, left to right measurement. Write down the measurement, stick it on a piece of cell tape, stick it on the end of there. Then you've got your measurement for your shoulders. And then that I would say that's all you really need if you've not got anybody to help you take that sort of information down. Um, in this little book, there is little swatches where you can actually write in the information in there. Wearing with ease. Ease is the difference between your measurements and those of the pattern. Wearing ease is including the pattern pieces from her patterns. Um, some styles are loose fitting and have greater amount of ease included. The standard ease for get weaving patterns is a bust is it um, in the bust is about three to five inches in the waistline she adds an extra inch and in the hips she adds an extra five to six inches of positive ease but a lot of knitters have to think about po positive ease as well and it's not something that i think about that often a second oh poop there we go do you know my phone the gadget was holding on to the volume on my phone and it kept flashing on and off but as long as you can hear me that's all that counts um multi-size patterns so all of her patterns wait for youtube to catch up with me all of her patterns have multi 
sized okay so she does small medium large extra large and extra extra large so <coughs> Oh, excuse me. So you'll see that if you open up these patterns. It's the same as any pattern that you buy anyway. She doesn't construct them in any other way than you would find them in a normal sewing pattern that you would buy from... Oh, I'm trying to think. There's, I think there's one company called New Wick or something like that. So inside Sarah's patterns, you will find these big sheets. And you can see... There, it's upside down, but you can see the different sizes that she's got and they go up in lines oh, along here. So you've got this extra small, small, medium, large and extra large on these coat patterns that I've got. And each bit has got the measurement that you need to adjust to. So that's where getting your measurements for yourself comes in handy for you to be able to decide what exactly it is that you need before you even start to cut out your pattern. So that's what you need to have. And then you've got to think about if you've never used patterns before, you'll always get on patterns that have um, rounded edges, um, little triangle tucks. And the, some of the triangles will face out the pattern and some of the triangles will face in the pattern. Um, so inward curves, notch outward curves and trim corners and press seams and open. So there's several different ways that she goes on about it in this book. But as I say, if you want me to photocopy this, um, I'm quite happy to do that. And she goes on about checking the fit, um, adjusting the pattern or lengthening or shortening it because we've all got different shaped bodies at the end of the day. Some of us have got long torsos and short legs. Some of us have got shorter torsos and longer legs. I think I'm about an average woman. I don't think there's anything odd in my proportions apart from the fact that I'm getting bingo wings. Um, but it happens to the best of us, doesn't it? Uh, what else? Then she goes on about if you've got trousers or shorts and how to shape them to, to suit your body shape and size um, and how to adjust them before you start getting to that point. Um, many of Get Weaving Patterns show the sleeve cut sideways and has this fit the fabric better sleeves are a bit greedy fabric a longer sleeve has two pieces joined together for an extra length um, a band can be added either from knitting braid inkle or contrasted fabric i've got some really gorgeous heavy denim downstairs and i was thinking of using that for my cuffs and for the back of my lapels on my coat and maybe using it for my belt all depends on how much fabric i've got and how much it shrinks um in the wash when I'm filling it so she goes in about the technical information about adding or subtracting from the the width of the fabric as well to accommodate different sizes um, especially if you need to add more and maybe your fabric shrunk a bit too much than what you thought it would do because not everyone's got time to do a sample piece so you may find that you come across moments of oh no I think I've screwed it up but you haven't think always think right what can I do to make this A, look a little bit different and B, still be able to get the item that I want to make and create without it looking odd. Well, look through your fabric stash. Go and see what you've got. Have you got any old coats that you've not used for ages that you can maybe cut up? An old denim coat or just for now, an example, an old blazer or something like I've got a blazer downstairs, a gorgeous duck egg blue blazer. And it's woven. But I can barely get my arms into it now. My back's just got that big now at my age that it's just too much of a struggle to get into it. Though I really, I, I don't want to part with it yet. But anyway, then the other booklet that I've got here is called Cutting Without Fear. Um, tried and tested ways to cut your hand woven fabric and prevent it from unraveling. A variety of methods including hem stitching, blanket stitching, knitting and binding to protect and finish your cut fabric edges so that you can progress with confidence from weaving scarves and shawls to cutting and sewing your own hand woven garments so this is a really good little pamphlet to have before you even think about any type of garments or making anything other than shawls or kitchen towels um so i mean what what's she got in here so it's obviously the the index of the stuff that you need she goes on about hem stitching knots and fringes 
matched uh, machine stitches to cut edges, machine stitched hems, weaving threads back into fabric, blanket stitch, knitted and crocheted edges, iron on woven interfacing and bias binding. Um, so cutting your fabric off the loom. So she just goes on about uh, following your washing instructions on the yarn label. Wash the fabric by hand. Now, a lot of us are spinners. So we have to test and try. It's understanding the fibres that we're using when we're spinning with it. Like in mine, I've got alpaca, flax, um, oh God, merino. What else did I add in there? Oh, it's all here. Flax, merino. Hold on a minute. Sari silk. Yeah, so there's the merino with silk and flax in it. Then I've used this little bit of nylon so it's, it's got lots of different colors in it it's one of my favorite merino nylon blends at the moment and i'm not a fan of nylon but i quite like that this is alpaca with silk in it and then i've used this gorgeous pearl fiber in mine so some of these fabrics don't felt some of the fabrics the fibers fabrics fibers do slightly felt and some of them felt quite quickly so I do have quite a good mixed medium of different fibres that as long as you don't stick them in a washing machine, they'll be fine. And I've plied the yarn with, oh my glasses are getting too heavy for my nose, bear with me. Um, and I've plied mine with a linen as well to give it extra strength. But so that the more I use the fabric and wear it as a clothing, the softer it will become. Um, which I just, I like the feel of it and the drape of it as well. So, yeah, so I have got a variety of different fibres that I've used in mine. But then if you look at clothes, or well, there's bamboo, there's another one. It doesn't felt. Um, if you look at clothes that have got mixed fibre, you get some that have alpaca and it's been blended with wool and it's got maybe bamboo put in there or viscose is what they usually refer to um in fiber so there's a lot out there on the market that have mixed blended fibers put into there so anybody who says that you cannot spin and blend fibers mixed up together are talking at the bottom because you go into the supermarket or any to any posh store you will find that most of your clothes have been mixed with other fibers like um poly cotton um angora but with sheep's wool um sheep's wool with the viscose to get a tweedy a tweedy fiber like with iron jumpers and things like that you'll find that some of those have actually been mixed with the viscose or tweedy top like like an industrial version of viscose tweedy top from world of wool that's all they've used because the survivors these are the exact same things that these big material factories and use when adding in incorporating and blending into our clothes that we wear every day so we're just doing the same as them but we're doing our own ratios okay there's not a single rule like that all you need to remember is what those fibers do when you wash them will they felt really quickly or are they going to be in partnership with something else that doesn't shrink at all so is that going to give more of a crimpoline sort of look to your wool or your yarn once you've washed it? Is it going to maybe jot out and create different textures in your pattern? Personally, I've never noticed it. When I've used wool and alpaca with bamboo fibres, I personally have never noticed it create a problem when the item's been washed afterwards. Not an obvious problem anyway. But I do do a pretty decent ratio when it comes to adding these things. Um, I'll always make sure, if it's going to be a woolly jumper, I'm going to make sure that that wool is the most dominant fibre in my hand-spun wool in comparison to maybe the 10-20% um, of different fibres that I add to it. So I may start off with a 60% ratio of Shetland, to a alpaca blend i'll maybe add 30 percent extra but then i want a little bit of shine or luxury to it so i'll add in something like pearl fiber or pineapple fiber to it to give it that lovely glossy shine on there instead of adding a glitter like an angelina or a stellina um or you could have a merino 
or you could have I'm trying to think a wool that's lovely but doesn't have much give so say you wanted um, to use rambouillet okay but you wanted it to uh, I've just thought you can now get I'm sure I've seen it in world of wool or somewhere else um, BFL superwash add a non bio nylon to it spin it off potentially you have got a jumper that you can stick in a wool wash in the washing machine personally I wouldn't do it oh can you imagine spending what the best part of a week spinning up a thousand yards of wool to make a cardigan spend the best part of a week two weeks in my case it could be seven years to complete a project wash it by hand wear it for a, a good couple of times before you think about washing it and then sticking the machine and it coming out and it's only going to fit a two-year-old i would just i i just couldn't do it i just couldn't do it the thought of my garment of all those hours of hard work gone into a washing machine and then comes out fitting a little two-year-old now i'll always all my hand spun stuff no matter what it's been made of i will always 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 hand wash it it's just not worth the stress <laughs> so yeah but I mean there's so many different things that are coming out at the moment I mean this for example this is called this is just something that I add into my fibers to my back just to add an extra dimension but this is called bikini bottoms okay and it is made now I was a little bit dubious when um, some of the companies started bringing out um, bio nylon so it's, I think, I think it's a biodegradable nylon. I've not looked into it properly and I should really do because I need to know my market. I have read up in it, but it's just, it's gone in one eye and out the other. But this has got a stellina in it. Okay. And it is a non-bio fiber. You can add these into your merino wools or into your Shetland wools for your walking socks. Um, not a problem. And it will help give it a little bit of stretch bit more stability and durability for hard wearing that's what these things are ideal for just to give that little bit of extra but they're making so many different things out of these fibers now i will have to look into it properly that the world will are promoting this fiber a lot at the moment but there's so many of us out there that are really not happy about the environmental impact <coughs> <coughs> the environmental impact of plastics I'm not 100% with it, but <coughs> I have got to think about my customers and the, my marketplace. So what my opinions are are not always the same as everybody else's. But that's not to say that when it comes to a custom order and somebody wants like 50% nylon with 50% wool because they want to use it for socks or <coughs> for kiddie jumpers that they can stick in the washing machine, that's fine. <coughs> oh god Phil can I have a cup of please no a coffee my tea do you know I asked him half an hour to go for a cup of tea <coughs> that's because I'm playing with fluff <coughs> please tea tea, tea. I'm doing Legos, so. oh there's the reason he's playing with Flaming Lego. I know I'll be dying. Oh. Oh dear, I do apologise, everybody. I'm really not well at all. I've sat here having a hot flush, but ears are popping. Like the radio stations are trying to tune in. I'm streaming. I can't stay. <laughs> I can't put my glasses on to read anything because my glasses are too heavy on my nose. Oh, dear me. Anyway, so yeah, I digressed on fabrics then. So you just need to understand your fabrics and what the capabilities are, okay? Make sure that when you're blending it yourself at home that you've got the right proportions. And you shouldn't really see much of a problem as far as I'm aware. Um, as to the way the fabric goes sometimes the best option is with cer um, certain fabric uh, fibers is to use them only for the weft and the dominant fiber that they used within that blend use that for your warping because it'll be probably stronger like wool or whatever but you don't really want to use something like a silk 
unless you've ordered it as a yarn and it's been spun at the manufacturers you can use that as a weft if uh, as a warp if you want to it should be strong enough to do that or it will be strong enough to do that but if you're spinning it yourself I would advise to do that as your weft like something really delicate that type of fibers because it won't have much shrinkage on the inside it doesn't really shrink that much silks um, and the plant-based fibers don't really shrink that much neither so it's just about getting your percentages right that's all it is but there's books out there that I've mentioned before that will give you all that information your weaving handbooks give you that sort of information what best fabrics uh, fibers you're best to use when it comes to doing your weft and your warp or using both of them together but you just have to remember about your shrinkage that's all you have to take into comparison um yeah i got to that from reading the i got onto that from reading the label on your yarn which as i said as has been as we can't oh so always measure the length of your fabric before and after washing and keep a note of your measurements along with your other details from the project this way you learn how much to allow for shrinkage as the loom waste um, as well as loom waste when planning future projects so if you like the feel of the way that the fibers come out once you've finished off your woven project like i've kept a note of all the fibers that i've used and the next stages as i go along i'll keep that in a little notebook so if i like the blend and i think it's come out really nice then i will do that again and then i can actually say with confidence that it does work and i haven't had a problem afterwards with the shrinkage um there is a variety of methods to protect and finish the ends of your weaving this illustrated booklet shows you how some of these you can try firsthand so hem stitching well we all do the french hem stitching most of us do french hem stitching when we finish off the weave anyway um but that's at the end i wouldn't count that as something that i would have to worry about to actually make the item because that's instilled into us from the very beginning knots and fringes you simply take a small group of warp ends wrap them around your finger to make a loop and then slip the ends through the loop to make a knot and it's a bit easier if you wish to twist them um if you want a if you're making a coat or a top and you want um hi Anne, and you want um oh if you're making a really pretty linen top or something like that and you want fringes down the bottom or fringes in the sleeves or if you're making something for a granddaughter who likes those little crop tops i have a scarf downstairs i will fish it out for saturday for my instagram live chat and when i was tying up and make um doing the the ends on this shot on this scarf well i say scarf i haven't decided what it's going to be yet i actually used um one of my shuttles and i I separated each strand after hem stitching and it's all come off the loom and I divided so say I had six in each bundle I grabbed three and I grabbed three and I did that and then put one three the top on top of the scarf at the bottom end left the bottom layer then I got my shuttle and I lay it on top of the bottom ones that I'd pulled out and then pulled the other ones over the top and then tied them and used them as a like an inch length once I did that, I took it out and I did the same again underneath, but then tied the opposite ends to it and I ended up creating a bit of a, a lacy um, knot tied at the end. A bit like what you used to see in the 80s on those old top crop tops that we all used to wear when we were kids. And you'd get the t-shirt and you would tie the knots in the bottom and all your mates always come back from Mangaloof with a new t-shirt and it all had these tassels all tied knotted, but they were sort of all lacy, that sort of idea. So, I mean... You could do that sort of thing if you knew that that top that you were going to make or those sleeves that you were going to make were going to be just cut down on that bottom end of that fabric. You could easily come up with something like that. She goes on about doing a twisted fringe um, for, like for scarves as well. So, yeah, these things that you could... It's not technically about doing your clothing, but then this is cutting without fear pamphlet um so she goes on about making a twisted end um, fringe makes very attractive finish especially of a multicolored warp you may uh, you need at least 15 centimeters or six inches of warp um for this trim them to the same length take a small group of adjacent two three or four 
twist them together in the same direction as the original twist until they start to kink. Weigh this group down, then work on the next adjacent group, and then after some practice, you can both do them together. But we all know that you can buy one of those gadgets and you just twist, twist, and twist, and unclip it, and they'll do it together. But I have sat there and done that twist, and it's monotonous. Uh, machine, cut your edges. Um, right. I don't know if you're able to see this, but you know when you're doing streaking on a cardigan for your buttonholes and some patterns show you how to, um, was it, you do your knit, 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 then you do purl, purl, knit, knit, knit for about six and then you do another purl, purl and then you knit, knit back on your pattern and you end up with your button band down the middle and then you cut through it and some of the advice is to do um, machine stitch two rows all the way down the centre of that section and then cut up through the middle. This is virtually the same thing. So she's saying, cut out the length that you want. Well, you want a machine stitch the length that you want and then cut in between both of those. And that really is your hem stitching your fabric. And then you just cut around it so it's already like that. So potentially we could do that for our garment. Or like Anne, you said you were doing the waistcoat, didn't you? So yeah you could do that so once you get your pattern or your fabric and you've got the measurements that you want and you've got your shoulders cut to the right or the shoulders measurements done to the right size that you want them and then you've got your arm holes underneath where your breath this section here the distance that you want on your waistcoat and then the length that you want on your body down to your waist or do you want it sitting just on your hips um, then once you've done that get your tailor's chalk mark out your measurements go up with your sewing machine and do a zigzag hem stitch all the way around that. And that you'll be able to then cut out. Thank you, love. Oh, I've been doing this for half an hour. Leave Flame and Lego alone. I'm up here dying, Anne, and he's too busy playing with Lego. Um, so, yeah. That's really good. So, cutting your fabric into two pieces, stitch two rows on both sides of the cutting line, and then cut between them. There's another example there. So, I mean, that, that's a simple enough theory to do that. Um, find a zigzag or an overlocking stitch as a tendency to stretch the fabric. So I don't recommend this unless the fabric has been stabilised. See page 10. Well, stabilised. Stabilised means washing, doesn't it? So we've filled it. So it, sem it starts to semi-felt or whatever it is that we're doing. Um, machine stitch hems. Secure the edges of your fabric with two rows of stitching. Trim the threads and, um, and you can hem your fabric. Okay, fold the edges over six millimeters and then stitch in a coordinating colour thread and then press lightly, fold over again another half inch and pin pin in and stitch and press. And then cut if your fabric is too bulky for a double turning, just turn it up the once and slip stitch by hand. Um throw it sewing your threads back into place. So just doing your weaving, but you want to make sure if you've got you look on our weavings at the, at the moment because we're changing the shuttles every time every so often you need to put in a new bobbin into the shuttle and you're left with that your, your end sticking out don't cut them it take it doesn't take long to do it i mean i generally i like to sort of once i've cut the back of my look my, my warp off the back of the loom of the back beam i don't unroll it straight away i like to just gently pull it up from the front beam go through all my little sections of threads and just go in two or three warp threads right along and then cut it so that when I go to wash it the fiber is already interlocking into each other okay so I just take my time with that moment that's my finishing off process I'll cut it off the back beam, I'll take it out of this, uh, this um, sleigh, out of the heddles, out of the reeds. Pull that out and then I won't move it off the off the front beam. I will just gently un take the cog off, get a soap, my darning needle, big thick darning needle, grab those edges and go in three or four warp strands across on that row, thread that end in and then cut it off and leave it like that and that's all I do. And then I will go off and wash all of that. But it takes a bit of time to do it, but it's definitely worthwhile. Sometimes I don't even cut them off until I've actually washed it and dried it. But I've already woven those sections in three or four strands in on the warp. It makes life so much easier. Then you don't have bits falling out and you've not got loose ends in there. 
that's what I do personally before I even get to the washing process. Um, blanket stitch. Yeah, blanket stitch is pretty if you're using your fabric, your woven fabric for just um, for a blanket, for a bed throw. Especially if you've done, I mean, if you've done something that's like 19 feet long, cut it in half, blanket stitch them, um, both ends, the warp end and the cut end in the middle, and then do the same again. And then blanket stitch them both side by side together. And then you can end up with a really, really pretty little um, woven blanket for on the bed or for the back of the sofa. And use um, a nice contrasting um, wool yarn for doing your blanket stitch. And even though you're doing it down the middle, do it all the way around the edging as well. And if you sit there and do it in the winter while you're watching TV, you've got the blanket on your knee while you're doing it. You get it done in no time. Um, so, yeah, so you've got your blanket stitch crochet or knit an edge onto the edge of something so like if you're making yourself um a poncho you say that you can't knit in just pick up the stitches as you go along use your crochet stick to create the stitches and then in them then cast them on to a knit tunisian tunisian crochet hook you could easily go through and start that and then get them on there and then add them onto a cable knitting needle it's a variation of doing it um where, what else have we got? What else have we got? And here's the suggestion. Ironing on what interfacing. So um, when you are cutting out the pattern and you've got your tailor's chalk or your tailor's pen that you can get a hold of these days, you know the ones that disappear with the heat, get your interfacing strips and place them around the markings, iron them into place. That will hold your cut ends. Yeah, get sorry, it keeps going sluggy, so I'm trying to stop whenever it does anything like that. Um, right, so get your um, your interfacing, cut strips of it if you can't already get this, if you don't buy it in the strip form. So I, I buy my interfacing by the meter because um, I use it for my project bags. Cut the strips that you need in the lengths. Get your tailor's chalk or your, your sewing, your tailor's pen, your marking pen for your fabric, the stuff that comes off in the heat or comes off in the wash. Mark out the fabric area that you need to cut. Get your iron-on interfacing. Place it in those areas. I was thinking of fine cordray. Um, I wasn't going to line it. What, for the back of your waistcoat? Or for underneath your weaving? I wouldn't I wouldn't put an, um, a, weight, an under, um, a lining onto your waistcoat anyway. I would just leave it the way it is. Because you can always wear some sort of vest top or a, um, a shirt underneath it. You don't necessarily... I mean, I've had waistcoats over the years and knitted waistcoats and they've never had a lining on. For the binding, I haven't even got to binding yet. I'm just thinking this is just ways to, um, to, you, to keep your fabric together when you go to cut it. Because some people are quite anxious about getting to that stage after it's been washed. So if you're using like a, an iron-on interface, you can, once you've got your tailor's chalk and you've measured out the area that you need, before you even start to cut it, get your interfacing tape and mark out, and along those mark out cutout edges, iron it on, and then when you go to cut it, it will hold your fabric in place so it doesn't fray if you haven't got a sewing machine or you're not confident at that stage to do that then the interfacing is a really simple way to do it instead. Um, bias binding. There's another thing that you can do. You can buy bias binding in many colours, but it can be fun to make your own to coordinate with your hand-woven fabric. Make a continuous bias strip. You will need a rectangular piece of cotton fabric. Cut on the straight line. Find the true bias by folding the fabric diagonally at one end and then cut this off and repeat at the other end of the rectangle. So that's what you can do with your cordray make it into a bias binding like that um, using the cut edge as a guide mark the wrong side of the fabric with parallel lines to the width of the desired bias strip um, and e.g 26 millimeters or one inch and cut away the excess so there you go
so yeah i I'm, i've made bias binding before and it's really quite a simple thing to do and then what you do is if you need it for full length you just cut those um angle sections those angle sections they will join together stitch them together and then iron them out and then you end up with a perfect yeah well, that's what you thought to cover stitching the cutting edges yeah exactly the, yeah i just hadn't got to the bias binding section yet Anne. you're rushing me there woman oh dear you're always one step ahead of me fold the strip length um Right, so use, using in stitch the long strip, the one strip extending at the end of Right, I am back, sorry. Got disconnected. Flaming internet. Right, you can get a bias foot for your sewing machine. A bias binding, I'm back. And I know I froze. It disconnected me. This is the problems I was having earlier on. Um, you can get a sewing machine foot for bias binding. They look like great little gadgets. Um, and they definitely work. So that might be something that potentially could be a lot easier to use and it'll do the work for you because then all you'll have to do is cut out the strips and then align them to the areas that you want your bias binding to be and the sewing foot folds it all in and sews it together for you so that's something you might want to invest in me personally i'm quite happy hand stitching those little fiddly bits. I like to sit there and do think fittery stuff at night time while I'm watching television. So that that's what I'd do. But you can buy the foot attachments for the sewing machine to do bias binding without having to go too technical for it. Or otherwise, go and buy bias binding tape that you like the colour of. I mean, for my, I don't even know what the pattern. The pattern must be downstairs on Deeth Malone. But for my my coat that I've got, um, I'm trying to think if it would need any type of bias binding. I think I'd be quite happy to have raw edges on mine. I'm not decided how I want to finish it off. So hopefully this week my tailor's dummy will turn up. My fabric should turn up at some point this week as well. Um, so I'm hoping next Wednesday, fingers crossed, I'll be able to do a mock-up of the coat that I want to do to make sure I've got all my measurements right, giving me another week, two weeks to get this last quarter of my woven fabric finished. I say finished. It seems to be one dilemma after flipping other. I mean, I tell you what, me and Phil haven't gone past three months since November last year of not coming down with some sort of cold or infection, but not COVID, just really flaming poorly. And I'm getting a bit fed up of it, to be fair. I really don't do being poorly. This one's floored me. I, I think, um, um, what day are we on? Monday. Monday was the day when it hit me the worst. I was literally awake for about 40 minutes and then I would crash like the nodding donkey like this for about an hour. No, an hour, three hours. No, it wasn't an hour. It was about two hours. And I was on and off like that all day. So, yeah, I was on and off for stupid naps on and off all day Monday, literally awake for about half an hour, enough time to have a drink and some tablets, and then I would crash again and fall asleep for like two, three hours at a time. And I was like that until yesterday morning. And I've only just started feeling a little bit more human today. So hopefully a couple of days' time. I need to get my back clubs blended up, you see. They're all died. I did all them, thankfully, last week. And I still need to get back over with Kath's, but there's no way I'm going to make it over there this week working with paint in a dusty house. So I'll have to finish off her work next week, but my back clubs I need to get done this week. But I'm waiting for this cough to calm down because the fibre is stuck in the back of my throat and it's really not, it's not cool at all. So anyway, on that note, thank you for joining me. Um, take care of yourselves. This will be obviously on the rerun 
tomorrow it usually kicks in to be able to watch again any questions or if you want me to sort out a copy or we go lagging again So if you want me to, whenever this catches up, so okay. So, sorry, lagging. If you would like me to um, either screenshot the pages, this, I can't sell you the copy and I can't give you the originals. These Sarah sent me these out for me, um, but I'm happy to include them in your batty clubs or if you have an order or something like that, ask me and I will, I will um, photocopy the pages from either one of the pamphlets. So you've got this one, which is Cutting Without Fear. There's that pamphlet with all those ideas in there. Or this one, which is where you're weaving mock-up for your own hand-woven go garment. So I can sort that out for you. Either take screenshots of the pages, uh, which will probably be quicker. Um, or I can just scan, uh, stick them through my printer and quickly print off a couple of pages for you uh, from these pamphlets. But I can't sell them on. I don't have the copyright to them, obviously. And I think Sarah doesn't publish them anymore anyway. These are from her original. These are what she uses at her workshops. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's me nearly an hour. I shall finger. Yeah, I will be here on Saturday. Phil will be at work. I've got things I have to potter around and get done um, and get sorted out. Box order for the Tour de Fleece. All the wool and the colours that I'm using for the Tour de Fleece are all in this box. It turned up yesterday. I just need to um, order <coughs> the um, coloured different silks for the doing the, if you wanted the option for the art bat spinning, which is um, 100 grams bat with 30 grams of locks, Wensleydale long locks, and a selection of coloured ribbons and textures that go to match with the, um, either B, D and C profiles. You have to choose which one you want. 200 grams of art bats for the other option, the exact same choice, let me know in the boxes. And I'm doing roving. I've got merino and soya, be um, soya bean blend that I need to get dyed up and I'm selling them and 100 grams, but you can have 200 grams and it actually saves you money if you order 200 grams. And I've got that down. So you've got three different options and three different colorways. On the website now i'm only i've only got a limited number that i'm doing i think i've put 10 for the 200 gram bats and the roving and the art spinning set there's only eight um pre-orders of both of those available because there's a lot of work that goes into getting sorted um closing date for pre-orders for the tour de fleece is the 5th of june i think i've put it as um so i can get them all ready and made up and sent out by the 17th of june in plenty of time for the beginning of Tour de Fleece, which is from the 1st of July until the 24th of July this year. Anyway, I will uh, mention it again on Saturday when I'm on my live chat. Take care of yourselves. Thank you very much. And I hope you all have a lovely, healthy, safe week. Bye-bye.